Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to week 23 of ENM 2020. If you've stuck with it for 23 weeks, uh, you deserve a prize. Not that I'm offering a prize because I don't have one to offer, um, but you do deserve a prize. Um, we are into model evaluation. And basically, we took this week to give you a, a bit of a more speculative talk about uh, alternative approaches to model evaluation, uh, and particularly about using the relationship between predicted suitability and associated uncertainty in, uh, in these models, and how we might use that as a way to um, evaluate models. So um, again, this was speculative, um, playful maybe, um, and not yet published. So this is basically about taking some time to think a little bit more deeply about model evaluation. And I'll start off by, by saying there's kind of another class of model evaluations that are also not, um, not based on predictive success. And that would be these, these comparisons to null models. Um, this was something that was started with a, a pretty controversial paper by Beal and, and colleagues, what, about 14 years ago. Um, and it, was, it had the title, The Climate Envelope is Empty. Um, and that, that was controversial because, at least in my opinion, the analysis and the interpretation were ill-conceived, but the methodology was really interesting. And essentially what they were doing was creating null species that were in some sense similar to the real species, and then asking whether the real species had a, uh, a distribution in environmental space, which is to say some kind of niche that would be more cohesive than the null species did, because the null species were conceived only in geographic space. So that was a really interesting idea and didn't get followed up on immediately, mainly because the code was really clunky and, and slow. Uh, when we tried to use their code to reanalyze and, and respond to the controversial parts of that paper, it was four or five months of computing to run you know, a few tens of species. So it was, it was Pretty, pretty onerous. Um, but more recently, other groups have come back to those, uh, those no model based model evaluations, uh, including Rob Anderson's group. So Rob, I think, provided a copy of that paper uh, in last week's question and answer. Uh, so you might look at that, but I just wanted to, to make clear that what we talked about this week was not the only model evaluation approach that is not based on predictive success. It's another one, and it's perhaps a little bit more out there and, and um, kind of exploratory than, than what's been presented so far. So let's look at some um, questions, maybe give you guys some answers. <laughs> Let's see, there we go. Okay. So there, there were some basic confusions um, and things like this one on 2561. Uh, what, is, what is evaluation without predictions? Well, all the evaluations that that Rob Anderson and I talked about last week were based on essentially the, the, the ecological niche model resulting in a map and then overlaying independent occurrence points and asking how well does the set of independent occurrence points coincide with the predictions on the map. Okay, now some of those were threshold dependent, like the binomial test. Some of those were threshold independent, like the, the receiver operating characteristic, ROC, AUC approaches. 
but they're all based in some sense on how well do you predict across geography where the species is going to be and where the species is not going to be. And so what we set out to do this week was to come up with a kind of a radically different approach. And that was based on, do you make any predictions wherever they may be and whatever they may look like in geography, but do you make predictions with high confidence? And so in that graphic of, of suitab sorry, uncertainty versus suitability, if your graphic is shaped like this, kind of like a smile, you know, U-shaped, then that means you have very few predictions of high suitability or low suitability that also have low uncertainty. And so you're basically not making, your model is not making a strong prediction of anything. And that would seem to be a crummy model, okay? Um, so we, again, this is, this is exploratory and this is, this is uh, quite different from what you've seen so far. Um, but essentially that's, that's what we mean by evaluation without a prediction. These are evaluations of the, the structure of the model and the distribution of uncertainty as it relates to the distribution of predicted suitability. Now I've got to take on this second question of, is there an R package that can measure the uncertainty in the models? Um, I told you this is all pretty um, experimental so far. The uncertainty um, measures that Marlon described, uh, well, that, that I talked about briefly and Marlon has um, dealt with in a preprint that I put online, uh, that much is in an R package. It's in, it's in part of KUENM. Um, so if you go back a few weeks, let's see, if you go back to, if you go back to this set of additional materials, so that is 1st of June, week 21, talk number one. Um, you can see that preprint. Um, but the stuff that I talked about this week, no, it's not yet in an R package. Um, but it's things that you can very easily do with a few simple GIS steps and a few simple plotting steps. So essentially, all you're going to do is take your map of the median output from whatever ma um, model, al model algorithm you use. And you're going to relate that to the, uh, the variation among the model outputs. So if you were doing this in KUENM, you'd take the median of the medians, and you'd also take the range of the medians amongst your different analyses. And you're just going to, to attach those to lots of points. They could be 10,000 random points across the area of interest. And once you have those two data fields attached to your points, you go out to some or another uh, program. It could be R, it could be Excel, it could be anything you like, but you just want to do bivariate plots and look at the shape. And that's most of your answer. You know, you can, you can calculate your in, the indices that we talked about, but those are basically just ways of quantifying what you're going to see visually, which is, do I have a lot of predictions with low uncertainty of high suitability or low suitability? Mona Marland, any thoughts? I know I took on two questions there. I have just to clarify that um, it's the the median is calculated from all replicates and all all parameterizations or all potential good models that you selected, not the medians of medians. Just just that. Also, the variance is taking into account like different things, but using all the replicates. 
and it's a little bit more like uh, time consuming, but uh, we know that medians of medians are not the same that the median of all individual replicates. So we, we think it can be a little bit uh, of an advantage. So, I mean, I, I appreciate the, you know, the kind of new world of, of everything's gotta be in an R package. But remember, the packages are just kind of one person's opinion of a workflow. So at the very least, let's rephrase the question. Can I do this in R? Answer, yes. Okay. All you have to do is relate your points to the raster of, the raster of uh, suitability and the raster summarizing uncertainty. And with those two fields, plot one against the other. Okay. Yeah. I think a, a powerful <laughs> user in R is somebody who won't just run the packages, but also can go in and grab the pieces of the packages that are relevant to a given analysis and a given set of needs. So don't, don't get caught up in, you know, which package are you using? get caught up in what are the individual processes and which are the ones that are most appropriate for, for the analysis I'm doing. You can do different things, not only the ones that Tom presented, like you can see what's the point that is more, interested, more interesting to you in terms of uh, variability. Like is it close to the threshold that you're going to select because that that's a, an important an important decision like the threshold that you're going to apply to binarize your your maps for instance what effect is that going to have in your models when you use different parametrizations or depending on the variability that you have uh, and that, that's an interesting way to see this as an uh, analysis of uh, performance of models like we know variability is uh, like it's derived from just changing parameters and things like that, but it's also like a good exploration of uh, what happens if, like, are my models going to be very similar or are my models going to be very different depending on what decision I take? So you're saying in the bivariate plot of uncertainty versus suitability, we, we were exploring those indices just as a way of, of quantifying the obvious, but mm -hmm. you may have very clear points of interest on the horizontal axis, like as Marlon said, the threshold that you're going to use to binarize, or you also may have points of interest along the, the Y axis, along the uncertainty axis. You may say, I want to see predictions that only vary by 0.1 on a scale of zero to one, right? You may, wanna, you may want the, the range to be less than some amount. And that would give you an arbitrary cutoff. So yeah, I mean, there are lots of things you can do. Um, don't take the method per se, take the idea, you know, very qualitatively. If your relationship looks like that, what that's saying is I have low uncertainty only for predictions that are equivocal. They're not strongly suitable or strongly unsuitable. But if I have a, a model that looks like that, then that's a really nice model because I have strong predictions of suitability, strong predictions of unsuitability, and who cares about the predictions in the middle? Let's look at another question. There, there is a, a, an interesting question on line 2536 um, <clears throat> that says, it, is field sampling the best way to reduce uncertainty? And um, at least, at least from the perspective, and this is, I'm, I'm gonna go off 
from this question. Um, so talking about um, validating uh, models, with, which is not the same as uncertainty, but I've seen a lot of, or some, some effort to, to validate models with field sampling. And I think, I think that that is complicated because, because we get into assumptions that the models made that are not necessarily um, reflecting reality. So we, the fact that we don't see, a, we don't find a, uh, our species of interest in the field after running some models doesn't mean that the models were wrong because uh, by now, by this week, uh, everyone should be aware of dispersal limitations, biotic interactions that are not are not directly quantified or modeled in our uh, in our predictions. So I don't necessarily I don't yeah I don't necessarily think that field sampling is the best way it has it has its limitation and in this in this context of reducing uncertainty i don't know if the the question has to do with running models and then going into the field and trying to reduce the uncertainty of the models by um filling in the blanks like lack of information that you you had when you ran the models, then you go into the field and you reduce the uncertainty that way of your models by by field sampling. So it's a convol my convoluted way of saying that field sampling has a lot of assumptions that we don't we are confounding our our validation when we try to do you know straight on <laughs> field sampling without uh, regards to what what the modeling framework is about. So, yeah. Now, one thing that I don't think it's been done, but it could and should be done, where this question, you know, kind of taking off on another direction from this question, uh, in a more in a more positive sense. Um, let's imagine you run a model. And you have, you know, these areas that are kind of definitely unsuitable and these areas that are definitely suitable. But then these areas in the middle, and sometimes they're very broad, they're more uncertain, right? They may have uh, a lot of model disagreement. And so you can imagine we have, you know, suitability, unsuitability, and in between a lot of uncertainty. That may be real. That may be real biologically. Maybe they are less suitable for the species mm -hmm. or marginally suitable for the species. But it may also be that your model didn't have a lot of information fed into it there. And so one really interesting thing, um, we're doing an exploration of this for some studies of meliodosis, um, but one really interesting thing to do is to use those high uncertainty areas as a guide to more sampling. Mm -hmm. And there essentially what you're saying is, I need to add more data to my model in that interval of conditions where I'm getting kind of equivocal results. Now, maybe what you get is kind of uneven and unpredictable detection across that whole gradient. And then probably it's right that it's just lower density or lower suitability. But what you may easily find is that there is some, um, some other factor or some more refined set of, of uh, values of the factors <clears throat> you've already considered that sharpen that, that break considerably. You know, you may just have had no data from that transition mm -hmm. zone. So I think, you know, one thing where additional field sampling could be extremely useful is in this idea of a first model a modeling round to kind of detect the areas that we don't need more information about 
we have clear predictions of yes or no that are unlikely to change with more data. But then detect the other areas where your model is not, not really well enough defined or well enough uh, fed with information and go out and do the field sampling to fill those gaps. Yeah, I think, I think this question, if it, re, if it refers to that, you know, you, what you described, um, area of uncertainty, that it's a kind of a continuum between uh, suitable and unsuitable, and you have a gray area of uncertainty there. I think, yeah, I think basically providing more calibration information, better calibration information to your models should help clear or, or reduce some of that uncertainty. Um, it's, it's a bit more, I don't know, it's, it's, I always, I get <laughs> worried when, uh, when I have students telling me, I'm going to, you know, run models and then I'm going to go validate the models in the field because you know, they, they could come back and say, darn, you know, I couldn't find the species in all these pixels that were predicted suitable. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of disappointing, but then I have to remind them, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, uh, how much effort did you put into sampling? Um, was it the right time of the year, detection? Uh, does this species have, uh, you know, strong competition, is there other strong um, competition relationship with other species? So all, I mean, the, in other words, the reality is much more complicated than what we, we are, the parameters that we have, we are using in the models. Um, so it's, it's reducing uncertainty of presence, but not necessarily uncertainty of absence, because that's always, mm -hmm. you know, we keep, talking about this in, in the course about how hard it is to predict absence. <laughs> and also just the feasibility of doing geographic sampling. I mean, for my dissertation work, I spent, I'm just do it, trying to calculate roughly, it was probably 10 and a half or 11 solid months of sampling where I moved, you know, camping and living out uh, I moved every three days for 11 months. And that was grueling. And, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, even though that was 35 years ago, uh, there are still very few species for which sampling exists with that amount of detail across the entire range of the species. And mm -hmm. so, you know, these are these are models that are, really intended to be cast at broad geographic scales. Yeah. And if, if they're intended for that, it's awfully hard to get the sampling mm -hmm. yourself to go out and test them. One last thing, there's also the temporal component. <clears throat> where, you know, if we run the models with climate data, 50 year averages or 30 year averages, from 1960s to 1990s, or maybe more recent, depending on our presence data, because you know, we are matching climate data to presence data temporally. Again, those are models that, that estimate the niche <laughs> of the species. And then we go in the field one, one season, and we are bummed out that we didn't, you know, the model failed. It's, mm, it didn't fail necessarily. <laughs> you know, try this, sample this for the next 10, 15 years and <laughs> see where you're at. Um, but it could be what you said, you know, the um, suitability, the range of suitability. So you're at the lower end of suitability. Um, that species might, you know, be present in, in, at those conditions and in those pixels or in the real world in those, at those locations every so often. And you're not capturing that in the low suitability range and in the high suitability range maybe that's where you can you can reduce the uncertainty and also yeah i mean also, sorry go ahead marlon no i also think about the the uncertainty from two perspectives the one that you mentioned in your uh, talk tom one is the error and perhaps uh, an accuracy perhaps that can be reduced if you sample more but the other component is the precision and 
let's relate it to uh, variability. That can be increased if you sample more. That can be uh, if you have an extreme value of environments that the species is actually using and it's inserted in your model, that can actually increase the, the variability, at least that comes from replicates because you are iterating uh, the model and it, you're picking su subsets or bootstrap samples of the points and then you can have even more variability. So it's always good to think about like the two components as well. Mm -hmm. And regarding like this, that you go to the field and, and either test your model or not, like remember that you're using just a few factors that the species may be looking for, like, like temp right temperatures, right precipitation, or right humidities. Perhaps sometimes uh, right soil components, but that's, that's less common. Uh, but remember, there is also like vegetation types. There's also like non-urbanized areas or non deforest areas because of crops or, 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 or like a bunch of things that can be preventing the species to keep being there where it was before. So uh, that may require a little bit of post-modeling processing of your results. And then you can have like a more concentrated sets of, uh, of areas that you can go and actually explore based on the idea that those still have the conditions that weren't included in the model, but that are necessary for the species to persist. One more comment, kind of going back to Mona's comment. You know, I don't think we think ab enough about what range edges look like. You know, we, we say, well, do you thresholded your model, right? And that threshold just basically says, Yes, no. Mm -hmm. But what is, if you were sitting at that range edge, what does it look like? So I, I've had kind of two, two things that have made me reflect on that. Uh, one is I've spent most of my life right about at the latitude of Interstate 70, kind of across the middle, uh, the middle part of the United States. And, you know, two or three really common parts of our bird fauna are you know, Carolina wren, bluebird, and let's throw in bobwhite quail. And I'm, I'm just old enough that I was, you know, active and thinking about um, severity of winters in 1977, 78, which were brutally cold winters. Mm. And it's really neat that Carolina wrens, bluebirds, and bobwhites at this latitude, which is fairly close to their, their northern limits in the winter, their populations just absolutely crash. They basically died out. And then three, four, five, six, eight years later, their numbers picked back up again. That was one of my very first publications back in the early 80s was tracking the population trends of those species. But then, you know, right here outside of my house, I have a little herb garden. And the basic idea is fresh herbs for cooking most of the year. And some of those are things that come back every year. And some of those are things that are annuals. But I've been really fascinated the last couple of years watching especially rosemary and parsley. Now, rosemary has annual and perennial versions, but I like the taste of the annual ones better. Yeah. So rosemary and parsley, both annual plants. But what I find is that the, the annual rosemary that I like, it'll last in my garden two or three years, and then one winter will knock it out. And parsley had always been a strict annual for us, in the last two winters, the parsley plants have kept small, low-lying, kind of mat-like green uh, foliage all through the winter, even through snow, and bounced back immediately. I didn't have to plant them these last two years. 
So I think we have to really think about, you know, it's not just like your abundance just kind of tapers off very gradually and deterministically. I think what it is, is that as you go from range center to range edge, or maybe from niche center to niche edge, the variation in presence, abundance, permanence, persistence, I think that just goes pretty wild. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, this year, my parsley plants are out of control because they made it through that last winter. <laughs> but uh, next year, they may get knocked back by the winter and have to grow back from, from their own seed from the year before or something like that. And so I think paying attention to range edge mm -hmm. and maybe even seeing some detailed studies of range edge population dynamics. They're tough, yeah. they're not rewarding, they're frustrating because low densities, high unpredictability, blah, blah, blah. But I think that's very fruitful for, for getting a better understanding of what it means to talk about range edges. Yeah. <laughs> okay, another question. Oh, let's, let's look at this one. So why did the team decide to show two plots, untotal and unclass? Um, it's, it was just two possible indices. You know, what we were trying to show, let me, let me draw it. Um, so we have this plot of suitability and uncertainty, right? And what we're saying is that these sectors are, you know, high suitability, low uncertainty, low suitability, low uncertainty. And we're just asking, you know, if we have a cloud of points, whatever it may look like, um, then how much of that cloud is in those two important sectors. If our cloud looks like this, then it's essentially zero. Let me see if I can find another. If our cloud looks like this, then it, it's gonna be pretty high. So all we were doing with those two indices was counting across our map the, the number of points in these two sectors related to either the number of points in total or the number of points that were highly contrasting, which were these up here. And so we were just asking, you know, we were just comparing the number of points in these important areas down here and here we were contrasting that number of points to some bigger population. And we didn't know, and we probably don't know yet, which is the better one. They're pretty closely related, so it may not make a lot of difference. But all we're really interested in is how, many, how much of our map is classified in these two regions. So no, no really good reason why we did that, rather just we're exploring the data. You know, and, and that is still a, an analysis kind of in process. What were we doing? We were asking if we generate models that we know are good versus bad, like a model based on a thousand points versus a model based on 10 points, we're pretty darn sure that the model based on a hundredfold more data is gonna be better. And so we just wanted to ask, do these indices that we're proposing, do they respond to those differences in model quality? So maybe it was too preliminary to present to you in a course, but I actually like the discussion that it's awakening. Remember, explore your data.
use your head, come up with some, some conceptual um, predictions or expectations and explore them. I, I think even this can even be applied to like a final way to decide whether or which models to present from your results. Like if you have already done a good process of model calibration or model tuning as other people call it, uh, and you have decided that like five, six, three or two models are like uh, kind of well fit to the data, predict well and have like low complexity, why don't you explore them in terms of variability? And probably that will give you an idea of whether like including one of them will be a good idea or not, depending on how variable they are, at least in the lower M or the right N, depending on your question. If your question is exploring suitability, which is something very risky to do with these kind of models, uh, probably the two ends are very important. And then if your question is only like areas of potential distribution based on suitability, then probably the lower end is more of your interest. And then like this kind of this kind of thing, I think can be applied like later on as well in the process of ecological niche model, uh, modeling. Uh, <clears throat> and they're good. I, I like the way people is taking like variability more seriously now because like models are models, they are not perfect. And therefore we shouldn't present just one answer. Yeah, I mean, watch the talks for next week, um, which will be Marlon, um, Bob Muscarella and Dan Warren. And they're about model selection or model tuning as, as Marlon mentioned. Um, but watch them and the criteria they're all using are all about prediction. And so that means that they're all about um, how well does our map anticipate our testing data. And so again, this is a completely independent perspective. Marlon and I ran for one study a, a a set of model selection approaches. I think they were applied to chimps in, in West Africa. And I think we got like 62 or 63 best models. And that was really cumbersome. So maybe we could sort through those. We didn't do this for that study, but maybe we could sort through those and pick out the ones that have the better characteristics of uncertainty related to suitability. So, okay, let's look at another question coming up on the end of our time, at least the end of this session, maybe not the end of our time on earth. Hopefully not the end of our time <laughs> yet. Yeah. So what happens if a model has high uncertainty, high uncertainty? Should we think about possible problems with the data should we check up what happens with other models or other abiotic variables? Yes. Which is to say, a model that has high uncertainty may be reflecting a species where you just don't have enough data, or maybe the species has a very complicated, highly dimensional niche, or there are a bunch of other factors that you're not able to, to incorporate. Maybe there's a lot of biotic influences or something like that. But yeah, if a model kind of looks bad, if it's um, very nebulous and uncertain in its predictions about everything, then yeah, you should think about, do I need to incorporate other predictors? Did I not clean my data enough? You know, some, something is wrong and sometimes that will be fixable. Many times it won't be. I like the question about uh, online 
2547. Can I assume that uncertainty is minimized by using an ensemble following approach? Interesting. Well, sometimes <laughs> more models create more variability in the answer, the suitability or presence absence answer. So um, it could give it could backfire. I think uh, you could increase uncertainty if the model outputs are very different, different um, different algorithms. The outputs of different algorithms are different, are quite distinct. I don't know. Yeah, the, the different uh, ensemble approaches, most of the, the, the better ones um, weight different um, algorithms based on some measure of their performance or some measure of their agreement with other approaches. Um, so it's not just, you know, like, introducing more more error because uh, we've thrown in some more algorithms. Usually an averaging approach um, has some level of effect in, um, in reducing variation just because you're getting multiple different solutions to a problem or a challenge, but it won't always be uh, for the better. Bye. See you later, Dan. <laughs> uh, so that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, take a look at Gengping Zhu's work with with um, with ensemble approaches and and finding best models. It's not exactly this question, but it's thereabouts. Yeah, and also. Like, let's assume everybody picked the right or a reasonable set of different algorithms, because remember, they do different things. Uh, but let's assume everybody picked like good, good, good options of these algorithms. Comparing those, it's, it's complicated. Sometimes they need different inputs. So I think that should be the first thing that can prevent uh, from having more uncertainty when you're doing like using, using multiple uh, modeling approaches. If you pick the right ones, then probably uncertainty is not going to increase that much, but you, you can have it and it can increase a little. But if you are like, for example, using random forest and like linear and quadratic responses in Maxim, your variability is going to increase a lot because random forest and Threshold, for example, in Maxim, those those features help you to classify things. That's the, the thing that they do the best. <coughs> Classifying environments that are that look similar than your occurrences. And those can be like spots. And then you can have suitability responses like something like this, which is which is not, not logic because if one species can live, if a species can live in like at 15 degrees and at uh, 22 degrees, why it cannot live in like 18 degrees? So those kind of things you need to be aware of before uh, even select the modeling approaches. And then probably that's going to prevent you from having even more uncertainty. Yeah, you, you may be creating an ensemble of apples, sea urchins, and asphalt. Right, it may not even be apples and oranges, which are at least both both fruit. These may be things that you're combining that are extremely different. Um, we're going to come back in the frontiers section of the course at the end with a really interesting presentation by Laura Jimenez and Jorge Soberon about the idea of fitting biologically realistic um, response types instead of response types that don't really fit the idea of an ecological niche, a fundamental ecological niche. And I think that's going to challenge, I hope that will challenge all of us to step out of the methods that we've been using for days, months, years, and decades, and do something that really looks like a fundamental ecological niche when we're doing niche modeling. 
Okay, that takes us to the end of our hour. So thanks, Marlon, and thanks, Mona. And uh, everybody look out for three talks coming your way on Monday.